Hello, everybody, and welcome to the WBGO studios. I am Gary Walker, and today a very special guest joins me, not only a fine trombonist, but a pretty fine vocalist, too. In fact, when we first met, uh, I was on stage at the New Jersey Performing Arts Center, and so was she as one of the five finalists in the Sarah Vaughan International Vocal Competition. I think she did Easy to Love, and uh, she did that Joe Williams blues tune, and she did You Go to My Head, if I'm not mistaken. Great memory. But she's here with us today, and she has a brand new recording out, and yes, she does both. She plays trombone, and she sings too, and her name is Haley Brunell, and the new recording is called A Beautiful Tomorrow. For this beautiful today, welcome to WBGO Studios, Haley. Thanks for having me. Great to see you again. Yes, it's good to see you too. For you, it started, although you call Philadelphia your home and you've done a lot of work with the Temple University Jazz Band where you've had the, the chance to not only work with Terrell Stafford, who leads the band, and he returned the favor by appearing on your new recording. But through that, you've, you've played alongside trumpeter Sean Jones, saxophonist clarinetist uh, Ken Pawlowski, uh, one of my fave trombone players, Louis Bonilla, yes. as well as Wycliffe Gordon. And you've gone on the road with Maurice Hines for the review, the off-Broadway production of Tapping Through Life. Yes. You're sliding through life, though, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> but it started for you up in New England, playing with your father. Your father's a musician, right? Correct. Now, did you play? Did you play trombone with your dad? Um, eventually, I actually started with him on on drums. I would I would play drums and sing, um, and then when I started getting into high school and got more serious about trombone, then I would play trombone and sing. And he used a drum machine for a minute. <laughs> what was it originally that attracted you to the trombone? My son played trombone in in uh, primary school, and and the reason he gravitated toward the trombone and it gravitated toward him, is that he had the longest arms in the class. <laughs> well, that was that so, was definitely not the case for me. Um, <laughs> it's actually funny. Trombone was not my first choice. Um, I wanted to play uh, the French horn. Um, and then my brother ended up convincing me that, no, you can't be in jazz band, so you should play trombone. Then you can be in jazz band in middle and high school because my brother's a, a saxophone and piano player. Um, so I, I sort of did it because of peer pressure, but it worked out. That's fantastic. <laughs> and, the, and the vocal side of your life, did that, did that come along in parallel or how did you develop that? Just a fan of tunes and things? Yeah, I grew up. Um, so I've been singing forever, longer than I've been playing trombone. Um, and it was mostly because of my dad. Um, he's a performer, does a lot of like Sinatra rap pack sort of things. Um, so I grew up with a lot of like great American songbook standards in the house. A lot of vocal groups like uh, Jackie and Roy, Lambert Hendricks and Ross, Manhattan Transfer. Um, so I just sort of grew up with that around me and we would drive in the car and sing along and harmonize. So I, you know, that's how I really started was with him. Well, and you get that entertainment feel from, uh, I, I think I read an, another one of your early faves through your dad was Wayne Newton. Yes. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's uh, how I learned a good amount of jazz standards was from, from Mr. Wayne Newton. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And you have this new recording. It's It follows on the heels of uh, I'm Forever Blowing Bubbles, mm -hmm. which came out. And if, and if you go to Haley's website, she's got all this great merch, man. <laughs> and, and it's incredible. And, and she's got a trombone with bubbles coming out. I mean, it's really hip. <laughs> Thank but you. This, but this recording, uh, a lot of it was conceived uh, during the pandemic, right? Yeah. Um, we Well, we finished recording it right before, fortunately, for the most part. Or Oh, no, it wasn't before. Oh, my gosh. It's been a long four years. I was thinking of the first record. Second record, yes. That was conceived during the pandemic. And once things opened up, we got right in the studio. So you had a long time to conceive different things. You know, let's let's talk about the title. Beautiful Tomorrow takes a turn on the very first track on the recording, which is associated for some reason. And I'm not real sure about this, but I grew up with Walt Disney. Talk about that. 
They said it, it was his theme song. Yes. Yeah, so this um, is the song that you can even hear today in the Carousel of Progress, which I believe debuted in um, actually in the 94 World's Fair before it was moved to Disney World. But yeah, this was considered sort of Walt Disney's theme for a long time by the famous uh, songwriting duo, the Sherman Brothers. And it's not a jazz tune originally. So how what did you see and hear, more importantly, about that tune that you said to yourself, hmm, you know, I could do something with this. Um, that one was honestly something that popped in my head. I'm, I'm a big fan of, um, it was a mix of things. I'm a big fan of Jeff Hamilton and the Jeff Hamilton trio. Um, and he plays a mean samba. So I was listening to one of my favorite records, Red Sparkle, um, at, at some point. And I, something I was on the internet or saw a YouTube video, something about Disney popped up and I saw something about the Carousel of Progress. The song popped into my head and I just had this moment of, wow, that would make a killing Samba. And that's what happened. <laughs> and this one was arranged by one of the special guests on the recording. Uh, the other trumpeter, aside from Terrell Stafford, is a cat named uh, Andrew Carson. And he arranged uh, that uh, recording. We should talk about the nucleus. It's yourself on vocals and trombone. It's also Silas Irvine on uh, piano, Dan uh, Monaghan on drums. Monaghan. Monaghan on drums, mm -hmm. thank you. And and Joe Plowman on the bass. Now you and Joe have worked together for a long time, haven't you? Yeah, actually the whole quartet, we've been working together for, for a while. Silas actually, fun fact, was uh, the member of my first ever gig as a band leader um, when I was like a sophomore in college. Silas was on piano. But uh, yeah, the quartet and I, uh, or that trio and I have been playing together since uh, we used to run a jam session uh, in Philly that started maybe a couple years before the pandemic. Um, and we've been collaborating for a while, um, but this record was really special because um, in the credits, you can see we co-arranged a lot of different things on it. So we are in that nice groove now, having worked together for so long. You know, a lot of folks hear the word jam session, and a lot of musicians gravitate toward the jam session. For someone, maybe I'll ask you, because you organized this, what do you learn from a jam session? So many different things. Um, one of the things on a surface level is you learn what tunes people are playing around your city um, and you learn who you like to play with because, you know, some of the best jazz musicians in Philly regularly host and attend jam sessions. Um, but really it's learning that synergy and how to play and interact with uh, a variety of different players. So you kind of can learn what direction you want to go in, what players you like, stage etiquette. <laughs> You're also a lyricist. And, you know, looking at you, listening to you, and just being in a room with your spirit, uh, it's hard to imagine that someone like Haley Burnell would come up with a tune called, I Might Be Evil. Uh, Where well, did that I come from? <laughs> so it's funny. I never saw myself as a lyricist or a songwriter. I had written some, instru some jazz instrumentals. Um, and over the, the shutdowns, I started, you know, getting that bug to want to write more. And my brother uh, writes a lot of music and he gave me the tip. If you don't have an idea from your own experience, try making a character or someone else that is not yourself and write a song about them. So that that's where I Might Be Evil came from, thankfully. And it's also it's not just a song about evil, but it's 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 a song about survival because there's a line in that tune. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a line in that tune that says, you know, you got to eat or you're going to be eaten. Yes, got to <laughs> eat or you'll become a meal. <laughs> We're chatting with Haley Burnell. New recording has come out, I guess, about three weeks ago. It's called Beautiful Tomorrow on the heels of I'm Forever Blowing Bubbles. And I think it was on that first recording where where you did Easy to Love, which is one of the tunes you did in the... The competition there at, at the New Jersey Performing Arts Center. Correct. That was with Andrew Carson, the same trumpet player. Tell me, what kind of experience was it for you at the Saravon International Vocal Competition? I mean, how do you balance the life of a, an instrumentalist and the life of a vocalist together? They influence each other so much, and that's why it was so special um, and uh surprising at, at the moment to have been accepted into the finals of that competition because I always 
was viewed as in Philadelphia more of an instrumentalist than a vocalist. Um, and that's how I started viewing myself when vocals um, and singing has always been a huge part of what I, what I've done. So yeah, um, that competition was just such a wonderful experience to be able to explore that side of myself more detached from the trombone, but they influence each other so much. It's really hard to have one without the other, how I sing influences, how I play in solo and vice versa. And they also influence other people. Case in point, there's a recording that came out in the 1950s, and, and it's called Four Freshmen and Five Trombones. And I know the, the record well. I have, and, a, I have and, it framed and, on my wall, actually. You and one of the it. trombonists is a legendary Frank Rosalino. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know this. This was the very first recording that a young Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys yep. purchased. And he would sit at home and listen to this. And he's told many folks over the years that it was this recording that inspired him when he wrote for the Beach Boys. Oh, wow. That's wonderful. I grew, That's one of my favorite records of all time. George Roberts on Bass Bone. It's, yeah, that's an amazing record. Now, when you were coming through school, who did you work with that... Uh, you know, guided you in different directions and said, you need to check out this bone player. You need to check out this individual. You need to check out, well, you're singing too. You need to check out Jack Teagarden and you need to check out some of these other people. Did you have, I guess, a mentor of sorts that worked with you or were there a few people? I was lucky at Temple. The music school has such a diverse array of teachers from Philadelphia, New York, beyond. Um, so I had a lot of different mentors. Uh, two that stand out especially were Greg Kettinger, who's a guitarist um, in the city. Um, when I came into Temple, I had played in big bands on trombone. I didn't really improvise much. So I started, in addition to my private lessons, getting lessons with him. So he's the person that really guided me and kicked my butt a little to make sure I was you know, listening to the right things, conceptualizing music in a, in a productive way. And also Mark Patterson, one of my main trombone instructors, um, was someone that sort of took a multi multifaceted approach to jazz and imp improvising through bebop and through, you know, those older bone players and thinking out melody and rhythm in different ways that have really, really affected me and how I play. Do you, know, do you know the trombonist Mike Davis? Of course. Yeah. Did Mike ever tell you the story when he joined the Rolling Stones? No. Yeah. When he toured with the Rolling Stones, he may still be touring as far as I know, but they were his very first gig was at Giant Stadium and he with the Rolling Stones, right? And he's standing backstage and there's like 80,000 people out there, right? Between the stands and the people on the ground and stuff. And he turns to Keith Richards. He peeks out around the corner and he turns to Keith Richards and he says, wow, man, you guys must have a hell of a mailing list. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of that. That's awesome. And that's something that that only a jazz musician could appreciate. We're chatting with uh, Haley Burnell, A Beautiful Tomorrow, A Beautiful Today on uh, WBGO. The sound is something that reminded me of, say, a Betty Carter scat through different ideas and how sounds can be wonderful, but sometimes... They can be overwhelming, too. I think there's a line that I, I, I picked up out of the tune that says, you know, my, my head's got to all the all these sounds, but my heart's not ready. Yeah, my head's a great composer, but my heart isn't ready for the sound. <laughs> yeah, um, that was another one. It's I was new to writing lyrics and I was just trying to think um, I'm in a wonderful relationship. And I was it was the very beginning of that. Um, so it was this feeling of like comparing all these sounds and that composition factor to getting into a relationship and being so overwhelmed by all these emotions you're feeling and maybe, you know, that reconciling with that. That's where that came from. Well, I'll tell you, having many years of experience, you'll learn to temper a lot of that and you know, <laughs> the thoughts will come and go and, and they'll be rather orderly, perhaps too orderly from time to time. <laughs> But uh, so the sound, it, it does get quieter and more palatable over the years. So hang in there, man. There's a couple of tunes here that are from uh, the, the, the old musical uh, No, No, Nanette, uh, T for Two, and I Want to Be Happy. How did you gravitate toward those two uh, pieces of, of music? 
Um, well, T for Two has always been a, a song that I, I love. I love performing. I love singing it. So that was just an obvious choice for me. And as soon as I knew I wanted Terrell on the record and it was this concept of, you know, this duo T for Two and he even plays a line that's usually sung. And so that was the concept behind there. Um, I didn't even, to be honest, I knew they were the same composer. I had no idea they were from the same musical until I uh, until I started researching. I was like, oh, wow. Um I want to be happy. I love because it's one of those great, uh, great American songbook standards that is a love story. But if you kind of compare it to like modern day love stories in a modern lens, it's pretty codependent and a little unhealthy. So <laughs> I love our twist on that song. It's we do. I try to sing it in a way that sort of brings that sort of maybe darker or even like an anger at times. If I want to be happy, but I just can't because you're not happy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not happy because you're not happy. Yep. <laughs> no, no, Nanette. Not today. <laughs> Haley Burnell, the new recording is a beautiful tomorrow. And there's a there's a gorgeous, uh, almost a, a duet, but I don't think it is purely a duet, uh, between yourself and uh, uh and, and Joe Plowman on uh, Candy. Yeah, and that's actually that is a duet that is just Joe and I. Um, that tune, it's actually funny. It was on the Manhattan transfer album. I listened to a lot as a kid, but as a kid, I always skipped that track because <laughs> I didn't want to listen to slow songs and ballads when I was young. Um, but that's where I knew it from originally. And then Terrell Stafford has a wonderful recording in his tribute to Lee Morgan, um, brotherly love, um, that I fell in love with sort of at that, you know, tempo and that pacing. And then Joe and I just we were going to do something with a full band. And then we realized, wow, this, this is really great as a duo. So we kept on with it. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, it's, it's a, it's a simple tune like that, a love song. Uh, it's a, even a simpler tune on the surface when you think of T for two, and then you watch Anita O'Day sing it at uh, mm. the Newport jazz festival. Oh yeah. <laughs> and it's like, it's like a real primer in phrasing. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> oh Yeah. Iconic. We've talked about a couple of originals. We've talked about some of the standards. Uh, we've talked about even that Walt Disney tune. I, you know, and I don't know. I grew up, man, with the Mickey Mouse Club, and I don't remember that tune. I think it came along in the '60s after I was after I was grown up. Yeah, it was six, '64. Was its debut? <laughs> oh, okay. So I have an excuse, <laughs> but I have no excuse if I look at a tune called. Walk Between Raindrops from uh, Donald Fagan's first recording as, as a solo artist, breaking away from Steely Dan, uh, the, the album Nightfly. Mm -hmm. And just, just the tune, to you know, the title of the tune, to walk between raindrops. What was it that attracted you to that? Um, so this is another, a lot of music I love recording is stuff that I grew up with that has stuck with me. That album is my father's maybe favorite album. I was actually almost named Ruby after one track, but my mom vetoed it. Um, but yeah, I'd listened to that, that album forever. And I remember listening to it right before deciding to, to arrange this song and thinking, Oh my gosh, this is just a jazz standard. <laughs> um, when you take all the, you know, the production out of it. And if you change the feel, it's the, the changes and how he wrote it. It's, really written like a really wonderful jazz standard i don't know if donald fagan would like hearing that or not <laughs> oh no i i i think he would love hearing that because oh, good. he is he is a huge jazz fan right and you know if you listen to ricky don't lose that number you got that horace silver intro there yes <clears throat> and and for your dad it's it's uh well they didn't name you ruby and thank god they didn't name you peg either right <laughs> <laughs> Haley Burnell, A Beautiful Tomorrow, the new recording uh, that is out on Outside In Music. And she has a website, too, that you can visit. She's got, like I mentioned earlier in our conversation, some really hip merch that is, that is on her website. I even like the coffee mugs, you know, with the, the little bubbles on them and stuff, yeah. or the coffee mugs with the trombone. That's that's really a great idea. So you're you're marketing yourself. Full circle. You got it all. You got it all going. Now, when someone goes to see you in performance, because at the New Jersey Performing Arts Center, uh, you did not bring your trombone. But uh, coming up, 
at the uh, side door in Connecticut, I think the day before the official start, we'll see if you know this, that it's International Trombone Week starting on April the 16th. I had no idea. I'm going to have to bring that up at my gigs this month. Well, you're there the night before at the at the side door yeah. up there up there in Connecticut, so you can uh, make make the world uh, aware of that. <laughs> the, you know this this record possesses so much. You know the straight ahead, uh, the funky, the, the 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 duets on Candy, which is you know we talked about is just really special. But you also take a trip of sorts to New Orleans with uh, the piece entitled Wayfaring Stranger. How did you discover that tune? To be honest, that was one of my first arrangements I made in college. So I have a hard time remembering what drew me to it because I probably arranged it in 2013, 2014. Um, but at that time, I was doing a research project where I went down to New Orleans and I talked to a bunch of musicians, David Turkanowski, Stanton Moore, um, and I really fell in love with, especially how Stanton Moore reconceptualizes New Orleans styles like street beats and dirges and Herlin Riley is another great example. So I, I love New Orleans drumming. And I really, uh, on my first record, I had done a little bit with a street beat section on a couple tunes and I wanted to bring more of that dirge, that other, you know, style into this record. And we should also mention that, that on the saxophone is, uh, is uh, Chris Oates. And if that name means something uh, to anyone that's aware of the world of jazz, yes, he is related to another Oates, and that would be Dick Oates, and he's his nephew. And so yeah. I would imagine, like yourself, he grew up in a household just full of music. But I think it was his father, not his uncle, that gave him his first instrument. Yeah, his dad's a, a great trumpet player. Um, Jim Oates. So yeah, I'm a very musical family out uh, from Iowa. <laughs> Another one of your incarnations, and there are many, is your involvement and your work as a clinician. Now, a clinician is usually for the older kids, but you do that. But you also work with the real young kids too, you know, like in, in grade school, right? Even kindergarten. Yeah. So um, when I, I actually, uh, my undergrad major was a uh, music education with a jazz emphasis. Um, and when I first graduated um, from college, I taught K through four general music. Um, so I have this sort of real love for that age group and especially connecting jazz music and improvisation. It's, it's wonderful to work with kids that age because they're so willing to try new things. There isn't that sort of ego in that fear. So that's why I love, and there's actually other initiatives in Philadelphia. Um, I actually work right now doing some uh, jazz educational programming at the Kimmel Center, and I run a program called Kinder Jazz, which brings sort of jazz education to kindergarten classrooms in the city of Philadelphia. You know, the thing that I like about the real young kids is they are fearless. Oh, there's, yeah. a, there's a guy that works over at NJ Pack as part of their Jazz for Teens program, saxophonist Mark Gross. And, and we took him into a school in Morristown, New Jersey once. They had won a contest. And so he, he went there and did a little session for the kids. They were kindergarten and first graders. And he was talking about the evolution of jazz. And he talked about this and he talked about swing, which made it popular music because people got up and danced. And then he said, but all that changed with bebop because you 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 couldn't dance to bebop and and from the audience you hear this yes you can <laughs> and he and he started, he said what who said that and and this little girl kindergarten girl gets up and said yes you can you can dance to any music and so he said let's see and so he played this bebop line and she got up in the front of the class and freeformed it with her feet. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. Right? So it's, there's a fearlessness, you know, that comes with uh, teaching or being in uh, a session with the real young people, you know. And I'm sure Maurice Hines will talk about that, too. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. when you worked with him on Tapping Through Life, what kind of experience was that working with Maurice? That was 
wonderful. That was one of my most formative musical musical experiences working with Maurice Hines and of course Sherry Miracle from the Diva Jazz Orchestra. Um, Maurice's life story is just so inspiring hearing how he came up um, was, uh, with his with his brother and his father performing um, in every seven shows a week. I got to hear Maurice Hines's life story and connect it with music and see him perform. Um, and it really just kind of showed this like connection. And I love showmanship and performing for an audience outside of just playing music. And a big part of that is because of playing that show with Maurice Hines. You see, and I'm of the age group that remembers Hines, Hines, and Hines Dad. And Hi yeah. I was Hines, Hines, and Dad. And Dad. You know, when, when they were little kids, man, and they yeah. were out there dancing either on The Tonight Show or, or – uh, well, the guy who used to be on Sunday nights, Ed Sullivan. Ed Sullivan, yeah. Uh, you know, they would be on that show too. And and later on, Gregory Hines uh, would become a, a pretty fair friend of WBGO when he made a couple of really important oh. records and also uh, starred in, in a movie with uh, about based loosely on the life of pianist Michael Wolf. It's called The Tick Code. And Gregory had the huh. the lead role in that much of which uh, much of which uh, that film much of which was shot uh, at the Village Vanguard in New York City, oh, and I so know, a, a very very talented uh, team of brothers. And as far as I know, they they were they were friends till the very end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as as I understand it. So the life story of Haley Brunell, maybe a little too early to take it on the road, you know, boning yeah. through life, you know, that's maybe oh, a while. That's, before... that's not a great title. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, like... <laughs> Might well, market the be, wrong people. It can, it can be, it can be uh, a rather, uh, it's an instrument of, of solitude in a way, isn't it? I mean, because, you know, the, the people gravitate toward guitar players and saxophone players. And, you know, you never see anybody walking up to a trombonist and saying, sir, you, madam, your, your limousine is right over here. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it can be, it can be full of moments of solitude, but that gives you the opportunity at the same time to, uh, to shed and come up with ideas, many of which are on this new recording. Yeah, and one of my favorite things about being a trombone player is I love playing in big bands. Big band is one of my one of my first loves. So that's being in a, a trombone section in a big band is one of my favorite feelings in the world. And your work with the Diva Band, you still work with them? Yeah, actually just played with them this past Sunday at uh, Dizzy's for their 30th anniversary. And speaking of anniversaries, they're also going to be on hand upcoming uh, the first part of June, I believe the 9th of June at the Sony performance space oh, in, the, yeah, in, in New York city, uh, celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Manhattan transfer. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be something exciting. Yeah, and I'm, I'm unfortunately not on that date, but I have heard just wonderful things about working with Manhattan transfer. And uh, I grew up listening to them. So it's been lovely hearing all these stories. Hopefully I'll get to meet them soon. Well, and the thing too about you know the vocal side of of who they are and what they are uh, has to uh, be appealing to someone like yourself, right? Oh yeah, and that's again that's um part of how I learned how to harmonize as a kid was my dad and I would drive around listening and singing along to Manhattan Transfer recordings, and I'd try to catch all the little harmonies in between their parts, and um, yeah, they are very near and dear to me. And you can be near and dear to Haley Burnell. On the 15th at the side door up in Old Lyme, Connecticut. Uh, it's a record release party, an album release party. And then the 16th in Cambridge, Massachusetts at the Lily Pad. And then uh, an album release show uh, on the 20th uh, of uh, April uh, at the World Cafe. Mm hmm. So yeah, it's World so Cafe Live in Philly. Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's been a busy couple months, but I'm very thankful. <laughs> what plans do you have? You're probably already, you know, because this this recording goes back, you know, in terms of conception for you, uh, in a couple of years almost. What are you thinking about now in terms of music and things that you would like to do? 
Um, so I have some new arrangements in the works with my band, um, some new uh, conceptions of standards like we do. Um, I've also been delving more into the musical theater space, um, more into some Sondheim recordings. Um, so that's definitely on the docket. I also um, have some big band arrangements in the works. So, you know, fingers crossed for the Haley Brunel big band soon. Oh, very nice. That's great. You know, maybe one night when Terrell's not working, <laughs> you can just you can borrow the band <laughs> and stand out front and make it happen. The new recording happens. Uh, it's been out, uh, I think, March 17th. It came out. It's Haley Brunel with Silas Irvine on piano, Dan Monahan on the drums, Joe Plowman on bass, uh, two guest trumpeters, Terrell Stafford and Andrew Carson. And then I mentioned uh, Chris Oates on both alto and soprano saxophone. And uh, listen through the raindrops, folks. Beautiful tomorrow for a beautiful today from, from Haley Brunel. And I, and I love this cover. You know, did you come Thank up with you. that idea for the cover? Um, so the photo shoot, um, the photographer Emily Krause came up with that pose with me and it worked really well. Then I did the album uh design and it everything just kind of came together um but we sort of that wasn't as planned as i want i wish it was i wish i could take more credit <laughs> if people want to know more about Haley brunell you have a website and it's haleybrunell.com yes right? haleybrunell.com so i ask this of almost everybody that i chat with <clears throat> you're in a car car of your choosing where are you going and what are you listening to in the car Ooh. so i want to say that i'm on my way to a to a gig but honestly i'm probably on my way to like home goods or tj maxx to make some impulsive purchases um and lately i have been listening to um i like i love 70s pop and like pop rock i've been listening to a lot of harry nilsson again which i have one of his uh songs on the album um yeah i have a lot of stuff from that era big beatles fan so in addition to jazz that's some of my my car ride music what was the animated the point movie? the point <laughs> oblio he also did the the music for the uh, live action uh, Popeye movie. Yes, me and my arrow. Oh, mm -hmm. very clever guy, man. Yes, very clever guy and a good friend. Used to run around and get in trouble with John Lennon. Oh yes, quite a bit. The, the Lost Weekend. <laughs> a few of them actually. Right, <laughs> Haley Brunell. Thank you for taking the time out uh, to to chat with me here at WBGO Studios. Continued success to you. And uh, I hope we'll be able to chat again soon. I know you got a lot happening, so you'll be coming back around uh, any day. Huh? Yeah, hope to chat again. Thanks for having me. I also wanted to wish a happy 44th birthday to WBGO. 